Hello everyone and welcome to Quick Med where medicine is explained quickly and easily. In this video, we will be discussing our beta-lactam antibiotics, which include your penicillins, cephalosporins, carbapenems, and monobactam. We'll specifically discuss penicillins in this video, going over terms to know, different types of penicillins, including the organisms they cover and their clinical indications, an overall summary, and as usual, a practice question to end the video. Our beta-lactam antibiotics are so named because of their beta-lactam ring, which is found in the chemical structure of all these antibiotics. In diagram number one here, you can see a basic structure of penicillin, and in diagram number two, you can see a basic structure of cephalosporin, which we will discuss in a separate video. Let's begin by going over some terms to know, which are key to keep in mind, because they can be very confusing as they sound similar. Our beta-lactam antibiotics work by acting on enzymes called penicillin-binding proteins, which help bacteria build their cell wall. When we use the term beta-lactamase, however, we're referring to an enzyme that is produced by certain bacteria to cleave the beta-lactam ring, rendering the antibiotic ineffective. Penicillinase here is one type of beta-lactamase, and it refers to an enzyme that inactivates penicillin specifically. Penicillinase is produced by most strains of Staphylococcus, including Staph aureus, so keep this in mind because this does affect coverage. Let's start with penicillin G and penicillin M, which are different in terms of their route of administration. These antibiotics cover many strains of strep and are actually the drug of choice for group A strep and interestingly for syphilis. Fun fact, penicillin was the first antibiotic to be discovered and it was discovered by Alexander Fleming. And because penicillin has been around for some time, many organisms have now become resistant to it. And so you will not necessarily see it being used very often in a clinical setting except to cover for group A strep and syphilis. Let's now move on to our penicillin A sensitive penicillins. And as we mentioned, these penicillins are going to be inactivated by penicillinase. And so they are not great for staphylococcal coverage. And these include your amoxicillin and your ampicillin. And make sure to keep the route of administration in mind here. They do cover some gram positives like your Listeria and Strep, but they are more of a drug of choice for enterococcal infections. These penicillins also have some limited gram-negative coverage, much better than penicillins. And keep in mind that as we move along, the gram-negative coverage will improve. So what are these penicillins used for? We can use them for upper respiratory tract infections like sinusitis and otitis media. And interestingly, keep in mind that amoxicillin can be used as an alternative for Lyme disease. The first line treatment for Lyme disease is doxycycline, but if a patient has an allergy to this, then amoxicillin can be used as an alternative. Now let's move on to our anti-staphylococcal penicillins, which include your methicillin, nafcillin, oxicillin, dicloxicillin, and keep in mind that dicloxicillin is the only one that comes in an oral form. Unlike our ampicillin and our amoxicillin, which we just discussed, these penicillins are penicillinase resistant, and so they are great for staphylococcal coverage, and that's actually what they are the drug of choice for. They will cover MSSA, or your methicillin-sensitive staphylococcal aureus, but also have some activity against strep. Let's now move on to two penicillins that actually cover Pseudomonas, which is unlike all the other antibiotics that we just mentioned. These include your piperacillin and ticaricillin, which when combined with a beta-lactamase inhibitor, which we will discuss in just a bit, give you much greater antibiotic coverage. When we combine penicillin with a beta-lactamase inhibitor, it provides us with much broader spectrum coverage against common beta-lactamase-producing organisms like your staphylococcal strains as we've mentioned before. So given this, there will be coverage against MSSA, some gram-negatives including H. influenza and Moraxella, and virtually all anaerobes, so keep this in mind. So what type of antibiotics are these? You're probably very familiar with the first one, your Augmentin or your Moxicillin clavulanate, which is an oral version. There is also the ampicillin sulbactam version, also known as unison, which is given in an IV form. In terms of coverage, these two medications are very similar. They're just administered differently. In an outpatient setting, you'll often see Augmentin used a lot, primarily for upper respiratory tract infections, skin infections, as well as animal bites. You can often use Augmentin as a first-line agent for a lot of these infections, so make sure that you remember its clinical indications. Our third medication in this group is your piperacillin tazobactam, or zosin, which comes in an IV form. From among the three, this is the only one that has anti-pseudomonal activity, and so it's often used in hospital-acquired pneumonia and diabetic ulcers where the likelihood of pseudomonas is much greater. Zosin has very broad antibiotic coverage because it includes your gram-positives, gram-negatives, and anaerobes, just as with unison, which we just discussed, except it has even better gram-negative coverage than unison. So given that it has such broad antibiotic coverage, it's easier to remember what it doesn't cover, which includes 
these four categories, which is actually what all penicillins do not cover as well. This includes MRSA, or your methicillin-resistant staph aureus, your atypicals, which include your Legionella, Chlamydia, and Mycoplasma, VRE, or vancomycin-resistant enterococcus, and your ESBL organisms, which stand for your extended-spectrum beta-lactamase-producing organisms. There are different antibiotics that can cover for these different organisms, so if you'd like to see a video on this, please let us know in the comments below. Let's now go over a brief summary of our penicillin class. For staphylococcal coverage, particularly staph aureus coverage, remember your methicillin, nafcillin, oxacillin, and dicloxacillin, or your penicillinase-resistant antibiotics. For pseudomonal coverage, we have our piperacillin and ticracillin. And when piperacillin is combined with its beta-lactamase inhibitor, tazobactam, you get zosin. For the best coverage of gram negatives, think of your penicillin and beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations. So this will include your augmentin, unison, and zosin. And last but not least, for syphilis coverage, make sure to keep in mind your basic penicillin. Let's now go over a practice question to solidify our understanding. Here we have a 42-year-old woman who sustained a bite to her left forearm from her cat two days ago. She comes to the emergency department because of increased pain and redness at the injury site. She says the cat stays indoors and is up to date on its rabies vaccination. Her medical history is significant for type 1 diabetes, for which she is on insulin. Her BMI is 24, vital signs are a temperature of 100.6 degrees Fahrenheit, pulse of 96, respirations of 16, and blood pressure of 134 over 76. Pulse ox on room air shows an oxygen saturation of 98%. Examination of the left forearm discloses two puncture sites with surrounding erythema. The remainder of the physical exam discloses no abnormalities. Which of the following is the most appropriate antibiotic therapy to administer at this time? For a lot of these practice questions, particularly those focusing on antibiotics, it really helps just know the first-line treatment for different issues because it saves you so much more time. But let's go through this question stem step by step before we discuss the answer. So our key facts to know here is that the patient has a history of type 1 diabetes. She has a fever of 100.6, and she also has two puncture sites with surrounding erythema. So you know that this patient is at higher risk because of her history of diabetes and also because she is displaying some systemic signs of toxicity, including tachycardia and fever. When it comes to animal bites, we want to make sure to cover for the different organisms that can be found in the oral flora of dogs and cats. So this includes your staph and strep, anaerobes, and some gram negatives, particularly pasturella. Typically for animal bites, the first line treatment is augmentin, which we discussed before, but because this patient has some more risk factors, IV antibiotics are appropriate here. So the correct answer is going to be your IV alternative of augmentin, which is your ampicillin sulbactam. All right, everyone, we hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please make sure to like and subscribe. And as always, good luck studying everyone.